Welcome to The Week Ahead, a podcast by SBM Intelligence. I'm your host, Veronica Pana Igube. Every Saturday, we explore stories that are shaping the African continent. This week, we begin in Nigeria, where after being idle for a couple of decades, the 59-year-old Portacot refinery suddenly resumes operations with trucks loading of petroleum products officially underway. Within an initial production capacity of 60,000 barrels per day, this marks a major step in reducing Nigerians' dependency on imported fuel. But as operations ramp up, how quickly will this impact fuel supply and stabilize the domestic market? The National Bureau of Statistics reported that Nigeria's economy grew by 3.46% in Q3 of 2024, up from 1.19% in Q2, driven by a strong service sector and imported oil, improved oil production. Unemployment fell by 4.3%, but with rising lending rates at 27.50%, how real is this pro progress? In Ghana, election tensions are high. Journalist Ohembe Nana Asedu was arrested for spreading false information while opposition leader John Mahama accuses the ruling party of voter intimidation. How will this affect the upcoming December elections? Joining us for insights today on the podcast is Shei Oudu Juwalube, a policy analyst at SPM and Kofi Ayeji from Ghana. Welcome Shei to the program. Welcome, Shay, to the program. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. It's always great Thank having you. Thank you for you. having me. <laughs> yeah, it's always great having you. Let's begin with the refinery of Portacot, you know, coming back. Is we have the initial capacity production of 6, 6, um, 60,000 barrels per day. How significant is this to Nigerians' fuel markets? You know, considering that we have always relied on imports of our petroleum. So, what do you think having this refinery would do for our economy? Well, um, the resurrection, as as I like to call it, of the Portacos refinery has been a long time coming. Uh, so the NNPC has announced, has initially announced seven resumption dates for operations at the refinery. But finally, this time around, uh, they announced that the refinery will begin operations on Tuesday and it's good. Uh, it's, it's good. On one hand, it is good because it means that Nigeria finally is adding value to the crude oil that is produced, so all of Nigeria's crude oil is not merely being exported, right? So, so yes, on, on that end, it is good. Uh, it has a lot of uh, potential um, benefits to the economy, and we wait to see how things will unfold at the refinery. Okay, I mean, know you said it has taken a long time. It's been a long time coming, and you know we're really excited to have like the refinery up and running. But given the refinery's age and past challenges that it has faced, what are the potential risks or limitation to maintaining a consistency production level? Uh, well, a, a mistake or let me say a misconception is that a lot of people want to compare the Potapot refinery to the Dangote refinery. However, I think that that would be an error because there's no way a 59-year-old facility or a 59-year-old man would have the same energy as one that was just completed, right? So when you talk about efficiency, when you talk about the quality of product, it is expected that the Dangos refinery will be more efficient given that it is 
made with um, more recent technologies and that um, so so yes it should be more efficient and so the quality of products should also be better than the blending that is currently going on at the quarter cut refinery so and what you have in developed countries is that the pumps at the petrol stations or at the fuel stations are usually labeled so that you can understand the quality of the gasoline or gas as a quality in developed country you're buying and so um, that's that's the first thing uh, a quality the quality of the petrol is going to be a concern and this is where we expect the NNDPRA, that's the national mainstream um, agency which regulates the quality and together with the standards operation of nigeria SOS, to come in and ensure that what the quality of whatever petrol or petroleum product is produced from this refinery is up to standards that's the first leg the second leg is that the government has already said that it would concession this refinery and the day-to-day -day operations of the refinery will be handed over to private sector players. So if the private sector is put in charge of the refinery, it can improve the efficiency and the day-to-day -day running of the refinery rather than have government um, workers take charge of the refinery and um, slow down its growth of processes due to bureaucracy. Uh, let's keep in mind that this Portacot refinery that has come on board is the old Portacot refinery, which has a capacity of 60,000 barrels. The new Portacot refinery, which, well, is still old because it's over 20 years old, is it has a capacity of 150,000 um, barrels per day. So, uh, um, given that I think that we can call the this particular refinery that has come on board, we can call it the test phase, because the success of this particular refinery is what will determine what you should expect from the Kaduna refinery that we've been told will come on stream sometime next year in 2025, and what also will happen to the um, two other refineries. Nigeria has four refineries, right? So what, whatever happens to the Portacot refinery is a signal to what will happen to the other refineries. So Nigerians desperately want to see their refinery work because it's described as a national asset. Nigerians want to see the refinery work. The Nigerian market needs it. And this refinery, together with the other government-owned refinery, is strategic if Nigeria will become a refining hub or a refining powerhouse in Africa. I mean, that's really brilliant. So one question that I wanted to ask, which you already kicked on to was, what role would the private sector play? Um, you had mentioned that they are going to concession it as well. But I also wanted to ask, does this what does this also mean for the other refineries? And you had said that it's a test phase. So my question that I, that I want to know is, does that mean we're going to see more refineries come into play? I know we have the Kaduna one, which is going to come into operations next year, early next year as well. But do you think that the Dangote refinery also did a, a, some good to, you know, charge our government to bring back our refineries as well? And how far do you see private partnerships and, you know, private sector coming into play with sustaining this um, production of or operations of our refineries as well? Okay, so uh, that's a lot of questions put into one, but let me try to unpack yeah. them. <laughs> First is that the Dangote refinery play a role in encouraging the government to kickstart operations at the Port Harcourt refinery. To some extent, yes, and also no. So um, some years back during the Obasanjo administration, we know that Aliko Dangote had tried to buy the for refine uh, try to buy the refineries right from the federal government. So there's always been talk about the private sector taking control of the state-owned refineries. But when that deal did not work out and was reversed by the Yarago administration, that's when talk about Dangote building its own refinery came into play. 
Uh, but as regarding this um, Portacos refinery that has started operations, the contract or the agreement that led to the rehabilitation of the Portacos refinery was signed in 2021. So the processes has been on since 2021. It's not because the Bank of refinery began operations that the federal government also decided to start operating the refinery. No. Uh, the, the, this particular rehabilitation of the Portacos refinery was financed by the Africa Export and Import Bank. That's African Bank. And it, it's a loan that will need to be repaid. And there, there are already terms and conditions attached to that loan, which I suspect one of it is that it has to be handed over to the private sector to ensure efficient management of the refinery. All right, so that's the first part. But overall, we cannot deny the good that the Dangote refinery is doing to Nigeria's economy. We can only expect that this will be increased when the refinery uh, is operating at, at its full capacity, right? Because um, having a refinery, there's so many byproducts from refining crude oil. It's not just petrol, diesel, kerosene, and aviation for no. Coal, which is used to make roads, used to construct roads, is gotten from, is a byproduct of petroleum refining. Uh, even the paint that we used to, um, the paints that we use to, to decorate and renovate houses, it, it's a byproduct. And several other things, plastic, even the gas, whether CNG, whether LNG, and all of these have the potential benefits to the Nigerian economy. You can think of the magnitude, the scale of businesses that will start or that will come up as a result of the Jangosa refinery or even the Portacos refinery beginning operations because Let's let's try. Let me try to paint a picture. Imagine a Portacos refinery that has been comatose for several years, and so there are probably no uh, convenience stores around. But because that refinery has begun operation, a lot of convenience stores will pop up in that area because um, the staff would need to buy everyday essentials. Uh, hotels in that area would also spring up. You would have shortlets. You would have entertainment uh, centers, recreational centers, because the workers there would need um, entertainment, their families, you know, schools and all of that. So that is the offshoot of just having one facility come on stream. And so when that is replicated in Lagos with the Dangote refinery, in Kaduna with the Kaduna refinery, and all the other refineries that are coming on board across the country. You can just imagine what that would do to Nigeria's economy. You can imagine how it would create jobs, whether direct or indirectly for, for Nigerians. And also, um, it's not just the Dangote refinery. The BUA refinery is also under construction and is expected to come on, on stream sometime in 2027 or 2028. So uh, I think that we can say it's interesting times, interesting times are ahead for, for Nigeria's economy in general. Yes, thank you very much, Shay. Thank you for the backstory on telling us how, you know, the refinery came to be. And, you know, and also it's really interesting times because then we're seeing more people come, more players come into the market. And hopefully we're going to see a lot of competition, which will, you know, bring the price down as well. So let's move over to Nigeria's economic growth and unemployment. So the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics released their report and stated that the Nigerian economy grew by 3.46% in Q3 of 2024. But how much of this growth translates into tangible benefits for the average Nigerian, especially with the rising inflation in the country that we're facing? because ever since those numbers were published, a lot of Nigerians have been questioning, how do you say the economy is growing and the economy is doing well when we cannot afford certain things, when we are forced to make lifestyle changes and adjustments? Um, so the fact that the GDP numbers that came out were higher than projection is, of course, being celebrated by the political class and their supporters. But when you look at key sectors within the economy that will stimulate uh, um, economic activity and have a direct impact on the 
citizens, those economies are yet to perform. And that is why citizens cannot relate, if I can use that word, or cannot understand how you can say the economy is growing when the sectors that directly affect and directly impact them are not doing so well, right? Um, the trading, the trade sector is not doing so well. Uh, manufacturing is not, ma the manufacturing sector, for example, contracted, manufacturing GDP contracted. And it is when the manufacturing sector is doing well that you can employ people, that they can produce goods and services. And when you have an increased supply of goods and services, the cost of these items will go down because supply has increased, output has, has increased. So this is why Nigerians cannot understand when you say the economy is growing. And when, when some analysts put it, they would term this as paper growth because the economy is growing on paper, but citizens are yet to feel the impacts of any economy growth. I mean that that's a I mean it's a disparity because like you mentioned there's paper growth and then what is happening in real life what we're experiencing as Nigerians. Um, so the report also you know focused on our unemployment which which dropped by one point three percent. Does this again reflect the realities given Nigerians' large informal sector and our underemployment issues that we're facing? Um, well, a lot of people, including uh, Yami Kale, who was the former director general of the National Bureau of Statistics, have uh, um, spoken out against the new methodology adopted by the NBS in calculating Nigeria's unemployment numbers, right? So what we have now with this new methodology is anyone who has worked one hour per week is termed as being employed. So if you ride a tricycle for one hour in one week and you get the money, the proceeds of that economic activity over the cost of one week, you're termed as employed. But how much really can one hour of riding a tricycle or a motorcycle or, or doing a plumbing job or a bricklayer job as a construction worker, how much will... Um, one hour, how long will one hour wage a week sustain you? And so when we talk about um, economic indices and numbers, it's, it's not just about numbers and counting how many people. It has to be related to the daily lives and experiences of people. We all know that Nigeria is facing perhaps one of its worst cost of living crisis in its economic history. Inflation is high. And the cost of goods and services are spiraling. And we've, we've already seen that um, multinationals, several multinationals are exiting. Those ones that have remained in the country are struggling. You can look at the telecom sector. You can look at the pharmaceutical sector. You know, these are the places that directly affect um, people's lives. So. Yeah. Um, the, the fact that these numbers have grown, and when you look at the numbers, as you have rightly stated, is that a lot more people are trying to sort themselves out, are trying to um, create businesses for themselves, and so they are they are called self-employed. And when you look when you look on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok, on Twitter, you get people who are selling bags from imported from China. Who are selling clothes, who are selling shoes, kitchen equipment, and they they're just operating in silos, small, small bits. And so from the side of the citizen, how much can they possibly earn that will that will make them be able to afford a good standard of living for them and for themselves and their family? And then even from the government side, you already know that uh, there's a certain threshold for company income tax and businesses who earn below 25 million will not pay company income tax. So it means that the fact that you have a lot of the small businesses around who are not paying taxes to the government, the government is also miss, missing out on taxes. So it's not it's not enough to categorize them as employed. It is to um, look, relate it to the people's lived experiences. 
and to see how many Nigerians are actually earning a living wage because people who are even working 40 hours a week are on that page. And so they are having to make all those lifestyle adjustments and it is reflecting in the economy. Economic activities are shrinking. So these, these are the issues that people raise when they talk about the unemployment numbers. These are what we should look, up, look at. It's not just about um, reading out percentages, but about taking a deep dive and seeing what is causing the, the reduction in the unemployment numbers. Is it that the, the manufacturing sector or people are getting into paid employment or are they just into informal employment? Because even with, sorry to just <laughs> be um, going on about it, but even the informal sector, we have the problem that the informal sector is one of the causes of Nigeria's financial inclusion gap. There's the literacy gap that as, as a result of our large informal sector. And so we cannot adequately say how many businesses are operating in Nigeria or how many people are, are living in Nigeria. And that's the cause of the informal sector. And so a lot of the revenue, a lot of the revenue that should have gone into gone to the government for infrastructural development is playing outside of the formal sector. And we can't have that if we want to grow an economy. Um, it's really interesting because you made mention of the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics having a new methodology. So don't you think that, I mean, it's also, data is really important. So don't, what do you think about this new methodology? I know you said a bit about it, but also, isn't that like a way for them they are reinventing the wheel to say, let's see how we can capture data from a different perspective. Or do you think that they also still need to revamp, revise it again to be able to see that they capture more accurate data? Or what are your thoughts on this new model? Because if they're trying to capture how many people are working per hour, per, per hour, and, you know, going down to the informal sector, like you made an example, someone riding a tricycle, are they going a deep dive to say, okay, what is someone in the market earning, a market woman earning per day or per hour? What do you think about this new um, methodology being used? Is it innovative or do you think it still needs to be tweaked a bit? Well, um, one thing that uh, my, my lecturers will always say is that social science is not an exact science. Right, because we're dealing with humans. Yeah. So, like true. the national Nat national bureau of statistics has said, this new methodology is in line with that of the international labor organization. So, this methodology is the same that is used in developed economies. But the difference between uh, Nigeria using this methodology or this standards and other countries is that other countries have um, should I say benefits, social benefits for, for citizens. For example, Canada yesterday announced a two-month suspension of sales tax on groceries and everyday essentials. And this is this is something that people can enjoy, right? We don't we don't have that in Nigeria. So minimum wage workers uh, or people who are unemployed or underemployed as we used to previously have in Nigeria. For example, in the US or UK, I are entitled to certain social benefits like food stamps and monthly payments. But we don't have that in Nigeria. So it's not enough to say we're adopting the standards of the ILO, the Worldwide Standard of the International Labor Organization. We should also look at what are the other countries who are using the same standards? How are they catering for their citizens? Because certainly, Except you are an Elon Musk or, or Bill Gates, you know, who can survive on one hour per week wage? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know in what world that exists. So it's not to say that the NBS is not doing well, you know, but it's that we should, it's um, social science is not an exact science. So because it has worked in America or because America is using this. Um, methodology does not mean that we should replicate it rather to in, in Nigeria. Thank you. For, thank you for your insights, Shay. So lastly, I would just like to ask, like, what policy actions, I know we've had over the weeks, we've 
brought you on the podcast and we're speaking about the economics. But what econ um, policy actions are needed to balance, you know, the economic growth with job creation, the purchasing power, especially in our current climate in Nigeria? Well, um, there, there are a lot of things that Nigeria needs to do or Nigeria needs to get right. And the first thing is that we even need to start with the census. We need to know how many people are living in Nigeria, how many Nigerians are there. So that, because the, the importance of, of gathering a, a national data is not just to say, oh, this data exists. It's to guide policymakers in their policy decisions. So if you say you want to, uh, or the government wants to create uh, a social benefits for the poor or people who are underemployed, you need to first know how many people, how many people exactly are underemployed. If you say you want to create tax holidays or tax incentives for small businesses or a grant for small businesses, you need to know how many small businesses exactly are they? What sectors do they play in? So that's the import of or the importance of gathering economic data. So. In getting Nigeria's economy right, we need to even know how many are we, so that we can know how many people we're planning for. And then we need to know what they need, what are their needs. We already know that food is a major problem. Food inflation is something that needs to be tackled because of the rising cost of rising prices of food items, which will only train higher because of the festive season that is approaching. So these are some of the things, and even it's not just enough to to recommend um economic policies for the government. We should we should be talking about the political will of the government to even implement those policies. Because the three months uh, or six months um import and um, import duty waiver on food items or certain food items and cereal and grains that the government announced was not implemented because there were. They were worried that the local manufacturers will be affected. Meanwhile, the government has gone ahead and announced this policy, and Nigerians expected that this would lead to a reduction in the prices of food items. So it's not just about um, recommending policies. It's about knowing how many people we are planning for, and it's also about having the political will to execute those policies. Thank you, Shay. I mean, every time you come on the episode podcast, it's always so interesting with your amazing insights. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure having you today and speaking with you. Um, I mean, you spoke about lastly political much. you spoke about political will. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we may have all the policies, we may have everything working, but the political will to push forward and you know, to continue striving to make a difference is really what is important and hopefully the Nigerian government will continue um, pushing um, for Nigeria to become better. So it's always a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we move to Ghana. Hello, Kofi. Thank you for joining us um, on this edition of the podcast and we have you here to speak on the Ghana pre-election tension. So it's, it's good to have you on the podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So let's just get right into it. So journalist Nana has been arrested and it has risen like a lot of questions about press freedom in Ghana. So how might this shape public trust in the electoral process, which is coming up um, December 7th? Well, first of all, we need to put the arrest, or let, let me say an invitation by the police um, in context or in proper context. So uh, this was in, uh, in connection uh, to a fake news uh, that Nana um, himself shared uh, using his platform, which is uh, I mean, one of the 700 radio stations in the country. And per what we understand, it wasn't an arrest by the police, but it was a, an invitation by the police to come and give um, an explanation of what happened. Uh, so what we understand is that Nana had gone on air to say that the elections were going to be um, organized in two folds, where uh, the first part will be for those who would want to vote for the 
the current administration, which is the new patriotic party, NPP. And the next day, those uh, uh, Ghanaians who would want to vote for the main opposition, which is the National Democratic Congress, NDC, and John Romani Mahama, will have the chance to vote the next day, uh, which is, um, you know, uh, obviously false. Uh, but what we also know is that Nana works for a radio station which belongs to an MPP, as somebody who is affiliated to the MPP. In fact, he's not just affiliated, he's one of the regional chairmen of the new patriotic party and so you definitely will expect that um such a platform will um, spew out or dis disseminate information which is uh, a bit skewed uh, towards the npp and narratives are usually against uh, the opposition party and so the police invited him uh, to answer certain questions and then also uh, um, let the public know that they are also on top of their games when it comes to the spread of mis and disinformation. So, in fact, for press freedom, uh, definitely Ghana has one of the highest scores in the sub-region. Uh, but getting closer, or in every election year, you have pockets of such issues. Uh, but Ghana, in terms of the uh, the sub-region, is one of the countries with the highest uh, press freedom index. Uh, but some of these, um, you know, incidents would definitely place a um a dent on the on the on the index but but the, the truth of the matter is that nana actually um uh was spreading fake news or disinformation and that was the reason why the police invited him to come and ask questions uh, so i think that's that's generally the, the context and the uh, the facts behind this current story that is making the um the the the, the, the current you know ways I mean, thank you very much for putting some context to that that story mm. as well and giving us like clarity to understand mm. the situation on ground. Because, you know, once people hear a journalist has been arrested, you know, one thing we just jump on is like to first um press freedom but it's good yeah. that you're able to give us the breakdown and the context to to what caused that as well but i also want to point out you know and i need some clarity on the issue mm -hmm. where the opposition leader has alleged voter intimidation how mm -hmm. do such accusations impact voters turnout and the perception of election fairness in ghana and you know as we're going into as ghana is going into the elections in a few days, what do you think this would have, um, the impact it will have as well for him saying, you know what, there the are allegations of voter intimidation? Well, I mean, uh, we are all in Africa and it's usually one of the, the hymn books that almost all main opposition parties sing from that they are being intimidated and that the electoral commission is, is, is not in their favor. We saw the same incident happen mm -hmm. The election that actually, the election. Hello, Vera, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Second one. Yes, so I, I, was, I was actually saying that this is actually a common hymn book that almost all opposition parties sing from, uh, that they are being bullied or, I mean, um, intimidated and what have you. It was the same narrative in 2016, uh, the election that brought the current uh, NPP um, you know, administration to power, they complained a lot about uh, intimidation and the fact that the police were using brute force against them and what have you. But uh, I mean, they were in opposition, but they were still able to win the election and came to power. Uh, in fact, if you look at the current accusations uh, by the main opposition party, although there is some level of evidence to it, uh, I would say it is not at the level where you would say there's a national, you know, um, intimidation tactics maybe by either the electoral commission or by the police service or the security services. Because at the moment, uh, what we understand per the updates we've gotten from the police so far is that, look, they are staying independent. They are not on anybody's side. And in terms of making sure that people go out to vote, this is this will be the election that we will have the highest number of police deployment across the length and breadth of the country, not just police, uh, but, you know, military and other security forces as well will be all over the place, not to do anybody's bidding, but also to 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 tell Ghanaians that, look, they are the independent guys and sort of like one of the referees in this year's elections helping to bring uh, fairness. But of course, you definitely will have 
uh, opposition parties, uh, you know, coming to say that there are incidents of um, intimidation and what have you. The main thing is that what I can report is that in the main opposition stronghold, which is the Volta and OT regions, uh, there is a current development, which the EC has actually confirmed uh, that they had challenges in printing ballot papers uh, in this areas, uh, which has actually also brought or has had, added a different layer to uh, the negative news around the elections. Because, I mean, if there will be ballot shortage anywhere, it shouldn't be in the opposition's, uh, you know, stronghold, which has actually raised questions about uh, the fairness or the neutrality of the EC in this year's election. But, I mean, definitely uh, you have opposition parties coming through with some of this information, but there's little or no evidence so far to um, intimidation tactics by either the EC or by the, the current government or maybe the the, the, the police force. Um, I, I, I have not actually seen any um, sufficient and enough um, you know, data to actually say it is true or, I mean, to, to confirm it. Okay, once again, thanks very much for that clarification. So lastly, um, I just want to, I know you, the country is gearing up for elections. How is they feel? How are people, how, how are voters, like, are people going to turn out? What is the atmosphere like in Ghana right now? Well, the country is actually poised for this year's election. Every place is, um, you know, actually on, 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 on tenter hooks. I mean, uh, this year's election is usually one of those ones that you say it is very close to call. It is actually too close to call. Um, I mean, we are expecting a high turnout this year because after in Ghana's election, if you look at the historical data, after a government is done serving their eight-year period, we always see a turnout in their quest to to at you know to 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 come for a third term, and so we are expecting the turnout to be above. Uh, the previous averages that we've seen last year was around 40, um, I think 79.5. This year, we are expecting more than 80% turnout uh, with regions in the northern part of the country having the highest turnout probably compare or, compared to or relative to the southern side of the country. And in terms of preparations, you could say that the police uh, or the military or, or the security services are actually uh, on top of their game, we've seen updates from them. This is the first time that we are going to, just as like I said, we have the highest number of deployment. And whenever you wake up, you see policemen, you know, on your street, trying to make sure that everything is right, trying to make sure that nobody is also, um, you know, putting themselves into any form of action or act that will cause, uh, you know, conflict anywhere. But definitely, there are hot spots. Uh, that have been uh, pointed out in this year's election, and there are more than 100 hotspots across the length and breadth of the country. And in those areas, the police will be beefing out security. Uh, but generally, if you, if you are in the country, you could feel the the tension uh, in the country where um, everybody knows that, look, just next week, it could be a make or break for any of the two political parties. And this year's election, whatever the outcome, will create... Um, history, just like in the U.S., where in our case, for instance, we also have a one-term president who uh, was kicked out in 2016, just like the way Trump was kicked out in 2016 or 2020, trying to, um, you know, um, uh, win power again. And also in the U.S. election, you had a vice presidential candidate who came from the main, the main party or the ruling party to become a candidate lost. In our case, for instance, we also have a vice presidential candidate uh, who is also seeking, um, you know, power. So it's just like the American election, one, too close to call, two, all other indicators are almost the same. And it, it's, it's a, it will be an interesting election. And in terms of security, I mean, because of the, the tight nature of the, of, of the election, we are definitely expecting that there could be pockets of violence across the length and breadth of the country, maybe relative to what we saw uh, in 2020 because one there's no lockdown anymore there are no restrictions in terms of movements it's, it's almost returning to the 2016-2012 election periods where we had a number of uh, you know violence but uh, i mean it's, it's 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 what the security will be able to do and how quickly they'll be able to respond to uh, some of this uh, chaos so at the moment i think that the whole country 
is actually ready for the elections. And when you walk around, you could feel the tension in the, uh, I mean, party colors all over the place, rallies, vehicles going round. And, 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 and in fact, this is the first election that I see that majority of the campaigns are actually on social media. And for us, we classify this as our first TikTok election. Why? Because TikTok is playing a major role uh, yeah, in, in, in the electioneering campaign in terms of the campaigns and what have you. The main a chunk of the campaign is being done on TikTok. Why? Because you have almost everybody in the population on, on, on actually on TikTok or those who are eligible, eligible to vote are on TikTok. And, and so you are not seeing the big rallies that we used to have in 2016 and 2020. But definitely, majority of the campaigns, the, the significant ones are being done on, on, on TikTok. But next week, definitely, you see political parties hitting the street with big regional rallies. And definitely, they will be ending either in the greater Accra region or the second most populous region in the country, which is the Ashanti region. Really nice. Um, hopefully, um, we wish Ghana all the best in their elections. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are excited to also see the outcome of the elections, as you stated, just like um, the American election. So that's yeah. all for today. Thank you very much. Thank you both for joining us on today's episode and for your insights, which enrich today's episodes. To all our listeners, this podcast is by SBM Intelligence. You can access our podcast by searching for SBM Intelligence anywhere you find podcasts. For deeper insights into our work, visit our website at sbmintel.com. Remember to connect with us on all our social media platforms. You can find us on X, Facebook, LinkedIn at SBM Intelligence. Thank you for tuning in to the week ahead. Join us next Saturday for more updates shaping the African continent.